two young men take a shortcut along the Columbia River. Here, near Kennewick, Washington, they will stumble upon a discovery that will rewrite the history books and launch a three-year legal battle. I saw what I thought was a rock. The top of it, what I saw, was pretty round. And then after I picked it up, obviously, you know, I saw the teeth. Little did they know, this skull would take us thousands of years back in time and forever change our notion of who were the first Americans. Forensic anthropologist Jim Chatters. Very long, narrow brain case. Fairly distinct brow. And a nose that just jumps off his face. Very pronounced nose. These are all characteristics that more often see on Western Eurasian skeletons, European skeletons. The skull appears European, not Native American, and shows signs of being a few hundred years old. Jim Chatters believes they have found the skull of an early 19th century settler. The police call off the criminal investigation, and Chatters collects the bones. Chatters cannot fathom the importance of this discovery. It will turn out to be a settler like no other. The first clue is in the pelvis. What you can see from the, the pelvis when we found it is uh, it has a very narrow notch behind the socket for the thigh bone, and that narrow notch is indicative of a male. Chatters will come to call this male Kennewick Man. Over 10 trips, he will collect over 350 bone fragments, about 70% of the skeleton. Only the smaller bones remain missing. Now Chatters will let the bones speak. Then Chatters sees something strange and bizarre embedded in the pelvis. Chatters takes the pelvis to Kennewick General Hospital. He begins with a standard x-ray. The x-ray will show if the object embedded in the pelvis is made of metal, like a bullet or knife blade. But whatever is lodged in the bone is invisible to x-rays. It's clearly not made of metal. The mystery deepens. He tries a CAT scan next. The CAT scan will take images of the pelvis from many different angles, revealing anything from stone to plastic. Jim Chatters gets the surprise of his life. Buried in what he assumed was a 19th century settler, he finds an ancient spear point. Okay, and this basin point here, sharp, clear, serrated or sawtoothed edge is characteristic of what we call a cascade point, which is a style that was most commonly used uh, between five and 9,000 years ago. The spear point cutting through bone and muscle left Kennewick man in lifelong pain. Chatters is baffled. What is a 19th century settler doing with a Stone Age spear point in his hip? The answer may forever change archaeology. Jim Chatters sends a small bone for radiocarbon dating, hoping to solve the mystery of Kennewick man. A chemist crushes the bone and begins the process of analyzing an isotope called carbon-14. All living organisms contain carbon-14. But at death, this isotope begins to decay at a steady rate.
By measuring how much carbon-14 is left, the lab can determine the age. Kennewick man's age is nothing less than mind-boggling. He is over 9,000 years old, a man who lived before 7,000 BC, and one of the oldest and most complete Americans ever found. And yet, Kennewick man is a puzzle. Scientists have long believed that the first and oldest Americans were Native Americans. But with his unusual features, Kennewick man doesn't look like a Native American. Well, the best way to characterize this is that for most of my career of more than 30 years, I have been following in the tracks of someone, and I thought I knew who I was following. And then finally, with Kennewick man, I caught up with him and he turned around, and he wasn't who I expected him to be. The traditional theory of the peopling of the Americas begins during the last ice age, when a land bridge opens up between Siberia and Alaska. A group of people leave Asia, walk across the land bridge, and settle the Americas. It was long thought that these people were the ancestors of Americans. Kennewick man may overturn this long-held scientific belief. But this hastily made video is the last Jim Chatters ever sees of his remarkable discovery. For only four days after the radiocarbon date, the skeleton is confiscated by the government. All scientific work stops as five local Native American tribes claim the 9,000-year-old skeleton as their ancestor. When the coroner came to get the bones, actually he called me and says, hey buddy, I gotta come get the bones. And I just virtually panicked. I felt that I had not had time yet and really wasn't equipped to gather all the information that collect a skeleton of this import required. So I felt I'd failed posterity. It was a pretty tough time. By 1990, there were up to 200,000 Native American skeletons in U.S. collections. In response, Congress passes NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Under this law, tribes can claim any skeleton over 500 years old as their ancestor, including Kennewick Man. What's going to happen to the skeleton if it's turned over to the tribes? It'll go in the ground. It'll go in the ground it didn't come out of. What that means very quickly is it will deteriorate and it will disappear. What happens in the next generation when 15 or 20 new methods come up that allow us to ask additional questions? We won't have that material then. The federal government begins taking the legal steps to repatriate Kennewick Man, but then eight leading anthropologists sue. They claim local tribes, even using today's DNA analysis, cannot trace their ancestry directly back to Kennewick Man. This is a Clovis spear point. It is the greatest technological breakthrough of the Stone Age, and long thought to be the oldest human artifact unearthed in the Americas. For years, these Stone Age weapons of mass destruction were thought to represent a culture of prehistoric big game hunters, who came over a land bridge from Asia to become the first Americans. 
but new clues are forcing scientists to rewrite an epic story that until now had been considered the gospel. Can these magnificent Clovis spear points over 13,000 years old help solve one of the greatest riddles of North American archaeology? Who were the first Americans and where did they come from? How people first came to America remains one of the greatest mysteries of our past. Archaeologists have been looking for the earliest for a long time. It's been a holy grail for them. Uh, who was first? The first clue to the mystery was found in a dried up lake in Clovis, New Mexico. Here in 1933, archaeologists uncovered a stone tool made by human hands, an ancient spearhead. It became known as the Clovis Point. Alongside the Clovis Point was the skeleton of a mammoth, which evidently the spear point had been used to kill. Later, scientists were able to date the bones establishing the age of the spearhead as 13,500 years old. It made the Clovis Point the oldest human artifact ever found in America. Archaeologists have now discovered thousands of Clovis spear points across much of the continent. There's Clovis in every one of the 48 states in the United States. Uh, Mexico, Belize, Costa Rica, in all kinds of environments. Clovis points arguably represent the state of the art in uh, hunting weapons on Earth at the time uh, and are probably capable of taking down just about any animal on the late Pleistocene landscape. In an age defined by its most valuable resource, stone, the Clovis spear point represented a great technological breakthrough, transforming rock into a killing machine. It's a very distinctive uh, type of artifact. As you can see here, it has a flake that's been taken out of the base. And uh, there's also a flake on the other side removed from the base. And these are called flutes. And beyond that, the projectile point is flaked on both sides. You see it's worked here and it's worked on this side, which is what we call bifacial. The bifacial design transforms a rough stone into a projectile with a serrated sharp edge. The fluting, some archaeologists speculate, allows Clovis hunters to rapidly load and reload the deadly blades on the spear shafts. Between 24 and 13,000 years ago was the last great ice age huge swaths of the northern hemisphere lay frozen under ice. These giant ice sheets locked up vast quantities of water, causing sea levels to drop far lower than they are today. When you've got that much ice on land, what happens is, is that it draws essentially water out of the oceans. So with that much ice on land, sea levels worldwide are lowered. By lowering sea levels, you expose the continental shelf between Siberia and Alaska. And that made it possible for people to walk to the Americas. Asia and North America were essentially one great continent, joined by a land bridge more than a thousand miles wide. But although it was possible to walk from Siberia to Alaska, giant ice sheets barred entrance to the rest of the continent. Then, as the climate warmed at the end of the Ice Age, the glaciers receded, opening up an ice-free corridor through the center of the continent. For the first time, it seemed, the door was open to the virgin landscape of the New World. As that corridor opens up, that's just about the time when Clovis appears in the lower 48. So it all seemed to work out very, very beautifully in terms of the timing of getting these New World peoples from Asia into the Americas. The timing of the land bridge, the ice-free corridor, and the Clovis dates all seem to fit together in a simple, elegant theory. 
13,500 years ago, Clovis people, big game hunters from Asia, armed with their lethal Clovis spear point, walked across the land bridge to the Americas, followed the ice-free corridor down into the lower continent, and spread across the land, killing all the great beasts. As Ice Age glaciers melted, the seas rose, submerging the land bridge. The descendants of the Clovis people, the Native Americans, remained isolated until their first contact with Columbus. The theory became known as Clovis I. It was written into the textbooks and taught for the better part of a century. The Clovis Spear Point became the icon of the first Americans. Clovis I was such a powerful story that for years, few archaeologists looked back beyond 13,500 years ago. But then, a few did. Jim Adebasio has spent the past 30 years excavating at Meadowcroft, a prehistoric site near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The deeper he dug, the further back he descended in time. On these surfaces that you see before us, we have signs of repeated visits by Native Americans to this site. These discolorations literally represent a moment frozen in time. Each tag marks ancient fire pits that can be carbon dated, creating a cross-section of who lived here and when, stretching back 13,500 years. Just below the surface I'm standing on is where the conventional Clovis first model says that the earliest material should stop, basically, that there ought not to be anything beneath it, no matter how much deeper we dug. But then, Adavazio did go deeper, below 13,500 years, to a time in the Americas when no trace of humans should exist, according to the Clovis first theory. He was astounded by what he found. The artifacts simply continued, and we recovered blades like this all the way down to 16,000 B.C. When he published his findings, he was immediately attacked. The majority of the archaeological community was acutely skeptical, and they invented all kinds of reasons why these dates couldn't possibly be right. Eventually, a few other archaeologists began to report evidence questioning the Clovis first theory, and they, too, were attacked. The best way in the world to get beaten up professionally is to claim you have a pre-Clovis site. When you dig deeper than Clovis, a lot of people do not report it because they're worried about the reaction of their colleagues. I've been accused of planting artifacts. People will reject radiocarbon dates just simply because there's not supposed to be any people here at those times. And it just goes on and on and on. Then, another surprise from deep in the southern hemisphere at a place called Monte Verde. This site of human habitation in Chile, 40 miles from the Pacific coast, was claimed to date back earlier than Clovis. In 1997, a group of highly regarded archaeologists went to examine the evidence with their own eyes. They saw weapons, tools and other objects, the result of two decades of excavation. After intensely scrutinizing the dating, they confirmed the artifacts were older than Clovis by over a thousand years. It wasn't until Monteverdi that we saw the first unambiguous, unquestionable evidence 
of people here before Clovis. It allowed us to think that perhaps the initial peopling of the New World was beyond 12, 13,000 years ago and allowed us to look further. Only one last pillar of the epic Clovis first theory was still standing. The artifact that inspired the theory, the icon of Stone Age America, the Clovis spear point itself. Where did it come from? Archaeologist Dennis Stanford decided to search for its origins along the route from Asia to America. But as he worked back from Alaska to Siberia, the trail went cold. The weapons and tools he found in Asia were quite different. After looking at the collections, we were disappointed that we didn't find uh, what we thought we would find. And I was surprised to find uh, that the technologies were so much different. The Clovis spear point is a single stone, bifacial or shaped on both sides, with a flute or groove at its base. The spear points in Asia are made from lots of small razor-like flints called microblades embedded in a bone handle. Microblade technology is making a projectile point or a knife blade uh, out of bone and then cutting a slot in it and then putting the microblades in the slot. Now that's a totally different philosophy entirely than using the bifacial projectile point, as you can see here. It's just a total different mindset. It was a puzzle not only for Stanford, but also his colleague, Bruce Bradley. Bradley is an anthropologist and a skilled flint knapper, an expert at crafting stone tools. One day, while making a Clovis point, he had a moment of inspiration. He remembered a popular science book he had seen when he was a student. It showed pictures of ancient spearheads made by the Salutrians, people who lived in Ice Age France and Spain. Their spear points resembled Clovis points. It seemed unbelievable, but Stanford and Bradley posed the question, could the Clovis point and some of the earliest Americans be from Europe? I was going through the old arguments. Yeah, well, Salutrian's 5,000 years older than Clovis, and you got the Atlantic Ocean out there, so I wasn't convinced that we really ought to push forward on it. I, I remember it a little bit differently. You say, are you out of your mind? <laughs> <laughs> Despite the unlikelihood of the connection, Stanford and Bradley decided to pursue the idea. Bradley thought an important clue might lie in the specific technique involved in making Clovis points. And you can see how this, starting from this side, went and took off this whole other side. This is what we call an overshot or outrepasse flake. A very intentional process. Overshot flaking was an unusual technique that left behind a distinctive byproduct big flakes at ancient Clovis stone working sites. Bradley wondered if traces of this technique might show up in southwestern France, where the Salutrians had lived 20,000 years ago. When he went there to investigate, one thing soon became clear. The Salutrians were a remarkable people. The Salutrians were responsible for much of the great Stone Age art of Europe and were the forefathers of the artists who painted the Sistine Chapel of the Ice Age, the Caves of Lascaux. They did a lot of carving in bone and in antler uh, and in ivory. Uh, they fashioned uh, spear throwers. Uh, they painted on cave walls. They had a fairly complex um, means of expressing themselves through their art. Could these remarkable Stone Age Europeans have brought the Clovis spear point to the Americas?
Bradley's research took him to the local museum in the town of Les Aisy, France. What he saw were hundreds of what looked very much like Clovis points. What we're seeing here is only the finished objects, only the things that museum people thought were really good for display. It doesn't always show you how things were made. To connect the Salutrians and Clovis, he needed to find out if they produced their spearheads using the same big flake technique. So what we do is we go back to the collections of the broken materials, which is probably 99% of what there is here. And in that, we're seeing the various ways that the Salutrian were making the things, not just the finished objects. And so it's the pieces that are hidden away that are going to tell us the most. And there, in the drawers, were big flakes, a clear sign that the Salutrians had made their spearheads in an identical technique to that of Clovis. This is a good example here that shows a kind of flaking that where the flake is struck from one side and went across the surface, removed some of the other side. And these pieces show it over and over and over again. I mean, just about any piece you pick up shows this very special technique. I just knew there had to be some kind of a connection. Clovis and Salutrian spear points not only look alike, they are made the same unusual way. To Stanford and Bradley, this was a powerful clue that prehistoric explorers had come from Europe and brought with them the technology that transformed Stone Age America, the Clovis spear point. It was an outrageous idea with a few big problems. The Salutrians' culture ended in Europe around 18,000 years ago, and the Clovis Point would not arrive in America for another 5,000 years. If the Salutrians brought the Clovis Point to America, where had they been? Stanford and Bradley needed to find some artifact in the Americas to bridge the time gap. They scoured Clovis sites across the continent, places where other archaeologists had been digging for years. Then, from a site called Cactus Hill in Virginia, a possibility. A point that resembled the Salutrian style, and it dated far earlier than the Clovis. Here we have a projectile point from a feature that dates right at 15,900 years or 16,000 years ago, which is clearly right in the middle between Clovis and Salutrian. And what's really exciting about it is that the technology here is very similar to Salutrian. In fact, it's closer to Salutrian than Clovis, but you can see that uh, it's in a progression between Salutrian and Clovis. So you have Salutrian, Cactus Hill, and Clovis. For Stanford and Bradley, the Cactus Hill Point bridged the 5,000-year gap. they had now gathered a broad range of evidence. Physical similarities between the Salutrian and Clovis spear points. A similar technique used to make them. And the Cactus Hill point connecting Salutrian and Clovis in time. All added up to a radical and provocative theory that the Salutrians invented the Clovis point technology and Ice Age Europeans were amongst America's earliest explorers.
Doug Wallace takes a different approach to the mystery of the first Americans. Instead of archaeology, he's using DNA to reveal traces of ancient migrations. Stored in his lab are DNA samples of indigenous people collected from all corners of the globe. DNA is the molecule of our genetic endowment expressed in a code of four letters representing four different chemical bases. Every cell in these samples contains DNA. But Wallace studies a specific kind of DNA, not from the nucleus, which is a random mix of genes from both parents, but from the mitochondria, the cell's energy factories outside the nucleus. This kind of DNA is inherited only from the mother and is passed intact from generation to generation as lineages diverge. But at a steady and predictable rate, tiny mutations creep like spelling mistakes into specific stretches of DNA. The amount of genetic variation between any two lineages can reveal how far back in time they shared a common ancestor. So what we've been able to do using genetic variation and comparing the genetic variation of aboriginal populations from all the major continents of the world, we've literally been able to reconstruct the history of migration. When Wallace and his team analyzed the mitochondrial DNA of Native Americans, they found four distinctive lineages that he labeled A, B, C, and D. All four turned out to share common ancestors back in Siberia and Northeast Asia. It was the latest report from colleagues of Doug Wallace who were investigating early human migrations. They were puzzling over mitochondrial DNA samples from a Native American tribe called the Ojibwa. When we studied the mitochondrial DNA of the Ojibwa, we found, as we had anticipated, the four primary lineages, A, B, C, and D. But there was about a quarter of the mitochondrial DNAs that was not A, B, C, and D. There was a fifth source of DNA of mysterious origin. They called it X. And unlike A, B, C, and D, they couldn't find it anywhere in Siberia or Eastern Asia. But it was similar to an uncommon lineage in European populations today. At first, they thought it must be the result of interracial breeding within the last 500 years, sometime after Columbus. We naturally assumed that perhaps there had been European recent mixture with the Ojibwa tribe and that some European women had uh, married into the Ojibwa tribe and contributed their mitochondrial DNAs. But that assumption proved wrong. When they looked at the amount of variation in the X lineage, it pointed to an origin long before Columbus. In fact, to at least 15,000 years ago. It appeared to be evidence of Ice Age Europeans in America. Well, what it says is that a mitochondrial lineage that is predominantly found in Europe somehow got to the Great Lakes region of the Americas 14 to 15,000 years ago. With Clovis I in ruins, and the Salutrian theory still hotly contested, now archaeologists must pull together their discoveries into an all-encompassing new theory of the peopling of the Americas. Today, scientists are analyzing material from America's most intriguing archaeological site, the Windover Bog in Florida. This rare material holds vital clues to the origins of native North Americans, and the scientists are on the brink of an incredible discovery. Yet the story of the unearthing of the Windover site itself is just as remarkable as anything they found buried within it. 
Cape Canaveral, southern Florida. 220 square miles of undisturbed marshland on the outskirts of the shuttle launch site. In January 1982, this landscape was to change forever. The remote district of Windover would be the site of 50 luxury homes. To prepare the road leading to the Windover housing project, construction worker Steve Vanderjack needed to clear a path through a marshy area known as the Windover Bog. Before long, something unusual caught his eye. It looked like a rock. The first one that came out, when I threw it off to the side to dump it out, I saw it roll off in the pile a little bit, and I found it a little strange, because you don't see a lot of rocks and stones here coming out. So I jumped off to take a look to see what it was that I did pick up out of there. And as I turned it around, it was looking at me. And that's, that's when we stopped. In the bucket of his backhoe, Steve Vanderjack had found human remains, a skull. Vanderjack thought he'd stumbled upon evidence of murder. Maybe some foul play, maybe an accident, maybe somebody stumbled off in there, or you don't know. News of the discovery traveled fast, and chief developer Jim Swan rushed to the site. Well, there's a, a flurry of excitement. They called me down, and I went down, and, and they had a bucket, a five-gallon bucket, with this uh, skull looking up at me that they had recovered out here on the, on the site. I'm no expert in that stuff, but it was so beautiful and old. The tannin had gone into the skull, and it was a gorgeous color of shiny brown, so I didn't think it was anything new about it. Jim Swan's instincts told him this was no modern burial and could be of enormous archaeological significance. Where there was one skull, there could be many. Jim Swan suspected they were onto something big. He summoned the help of anthropologist Glenn Doran, then a young assistant professor at Florida State University, and an expert on human bog remains. Within weeks of the remarkable discovery of the skull, Glenn Doran arrived in Windover to examine the bog. He was intrigued by what he saw. There was a relatively small, little nasty water black pond. And at first glance, it didn't look like a particularly inviting place for an archaeological site. But then we got out and we started walking up and down and looking at the, the piles of peat. And within just a few minutes, we started seeing clusters of human skeletal material. Immediately, Glenn Doran found clues to the age of the site in the skull's recently exposed teeth. Modern teeth are smooth and intact, ancient ones worn down. The dramatic wear on these teeth told Glenn Doran the Windover site was older than anyone imagined. You could look at the teeth and instantly see that, no, this was not a crime scene, this was not a forensic case. It was clearly somebody who had lived, you know, thousands of years ago. Most human remains found in Florida are less than 500 years old. Glenn Doran's big challenge was to study the bog's hidden clues to figure out exactly how much older the Windover bones could be. There were a couple of things that were immediately obvious and interesting. One is the skeletal material was extremely well preserved. Secondly, when you looked in the peat itself, you didn't see any, any ceramic material. And ceramics to us are an indication of materials of the last, say, 4,000 years. But the fact that there wasn't any ceramic material in there was really the first hint that this material could be quite old. Glenn Doran suspected the remains could date as far back as 1,500 BC to around the same time as King Tutankhamun in Egypt. But to be certain, he needed to send a sample of Windover bone to be radiocarbon dated. So we took some of the bone samples, sent them off to the lab, and then it was a, a waiting game. And then finally, we got the word back that the materials were over 7,000 years old. I mean, you, we were really walking on clouds. I mean, it just unbelievably exceeded our, our expectation. We knew we had this just incredible once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Glenn Doran had stumbled on the exceptionally rare remains of ancient Americans so rare that the five skulls and three bones he'd found were already the largest human collection of this age in America. 
it really gives us the most vivid picture of prehistoric life you can possibly imagine. It gives us more information to get really right down to the nitty gritty of everyday life, of health, of sickness, the human tragedy of injury and disease. What was it really like to be alive in Florida seven plus thousand years ago? The Windover bones belong to people who lived over 3,000 years before the first pyramids were built in Egypt, and almost 6,000 years before the birth of Christ. They were some of the very first people to set foot in the Americas. But to find out if there were more bones buried deep beneath the bog, Glenn Doran was faced with a monumental problem. He would have to drain the bog dry, and that meant pumping out millions of gallons of water. The plan is to put a well point system in, pump it out, and then start in this area of the pond itself. In 1984, after two solid years of planning and fundraising, 130 wells were sunk deep into the peat pumping out 1,000 gallons of water a minute around the clock. As the Windover Marsh drained, Glenn Doran was confronted by a unique and breathtaking sight. This wasn't a scattering of bodies, but a cemetery. Doran's lucky find had turned into an archaeological treasure trove. Sealed in this extraordinary peaty grave lay the remains of hundreds of men, women, and children of all ages, Glenn Doran could also make out bone and antler tools and delicately carved wooden objects that had survived for over 7,000 years. What could be learned from Windover was tantalizing. It was everything Doran had hoped for and more. Sealed in an airtight cocoon of peat, the fungi and bacteria that caused decay were shut out. What's more, the Windover peat itself was special not acidic like most peat, but neutral and perfect for the conservation of bones. It's virtually an optimal environment. You couldn't ask for a better preservation medium. By late 1986, Glenn Doran's excavation team had endured almost three years of painstaking exploration of southern Florida's Windover marshland. Mentally exhausted and physically drained, little did they know they were about to uncover their most significant find, a mysterious substance covering some of the bones. It was neither human flesh nor animal hide. Professor Doran thought he could detect tiny fibers and you could see it. It was a piece of seven plus thousand year old twine. It was, in a sense, as good as the day it was manufactured. You could see the twist and it was obvious. This was hand woven fabric. If Doran's hunch was right and these mystery fibers were the remains of a textile, then this would send shock waves through the scientific community. These threads would be the oldest fabric of any importance in America and the only surviving proof that such ancient people could weave. We were also pretty quick to realize that none of us on this team had had any experience in analyzing fabric materials. Doran contacted America's foremost expert on ancient textiles, Dr. James Adavazio. I and my late wife, Rhonda, went down and walked on the site on one of those days when it was 95 degrees, the humidity was 90%. The sweat was dripping all over the place. They physically uncovered the suspect area in one of the burials, and the light was just perfect to indicate that that's exactly what it was where textile remains. They would look at one, and then they would move a few feet, and look at the second one, and then stand up and move to the third one. And after about an hour and a half of this, I asked Jim, I said, was it worth the plane ticket to Florida? And he stood up, and he says, you better believe it. This is like nothing we've ever seen. And so we, in fact, told them, well, these are twine textiles. And after the requisite leaping up and down and screaming and yelling, 
We decided to then figure out where to go next with all this. Once again, the discoveries at Windover were forcing scientists to junk the idea that ancient Americans were primitive people. By 1986, over 10,000 bones and hundreds of artifacts had been painstakingly excavated from the Windover bog. But as soon as the fabrics were removed from the protective peat, they began to decompose almost immediately. The race was on to save these precious ancient garments from certain destruction. When we started to identify the fabric materials, there were sort of two things that went through our mind instantly. One was, did we have the preservation techniques in place to deal with this? And the answer was pretty easily no. Glenn Dora needed to try the latest techniques, the very best science could offer. So he turned to Bruce Humphrey, the man who'd saved relics from the Titanic. Humphrey's innovative secret process involved coating the objects in a microscopic layer of the chemical perylene. The place where perylene really shines in the preservation world is with the most fragile, the most degraded uh, materials that uh, would otherwise perhaps be lost. There is no known way of preserving them by normal conservative techniques. And with perylene, we can deal with these kind of objects and save these materials that are simply in danger of being lost altogether. Paraline acts as molecular glue, a barely traceable layer of preservative that penetrates the object. In this case, paper burnt to ash, invisibly strengthening it and preventing decay. The coating cycle is now complete and the chamber has been returned to atmosphere. We're going to lift the lid. Inside is our cell with the ash paper. And in a little over an hour's time, We've transformed this fragile, friable material to a completely handleable substrate. If we compare it with its other cousin over here that wasn't treated, you can see the extreme difference in handleability. This is a, a film of perylene. As you can see, it's not unlike saran wrap. So invisible is it that we can do amazing things. I'll give you an example, this material is from RMS Titanic. This is a magazine that we theorize belonged to a first-class passenger. It was rolled up and casually put in a suitcase and spent 85 years on the bottom of the ocean at 12,600 feet and recovered during one of the expeditions to the site. In April 1989, a desperate James Atavasio agreed to let Bruce Humphrey test his state-of-the-art paralene process on a rapidly decaying fabric sample. Even Humphrey was overwhelmed by the result. It was an amazing sight to see these materials uh, come through this entire process of desalinating freeze rind and then have them come out of the chamber with this amazing definition to the fabric. I mean, some of the fragments that we've done so far, you can see minute detail and you can even examine these fabrics under a microscope and the perylene does not interfere with studying the microstructure of the weave or anything like that. So it's an amazing result. James Atavasio couldn't believe his eyes. This revolutionary process saved his rare and delicate samples. This piece that I'm orienting, I haven't touched with my own hands for more than 10 years. To see it like this, remarkably similar to when I first saw it come out of the ground, to be able to pick it up, to be able to show it to you, is impossible to put into words compared to the fragility of the specimen when we first encountered it. For the first time, fragile fabrics like Windover's could be preserved and studied at leisure. Dr. Joe Lorenz of the Coriel Institute in Camden, New Jersey, is performing brand new analysis of the brain DNA using techniques no one had access to back in the 1980s. Lorenz is re-examining sections of DNA called haplogroups in the brains of five Windover people. He's looking for haplogroups found only in native North Americans because finding them would corroborate all previous work. When I sequenced larger fragments and I was looking for the sites that I know are characteristic of Native American haplogroups, um, I was surprised because I did not find them. In contrast to all previous findings, Lorenz couldn't confirm the Windover people were Americans. Further investigation revealed something even more remarkable. I went back 
to the screen and I looked at the sequences again, the first person's DNA, it looked European. When I looked at the second one, it looked European. When I looked at the third, fourth, and fifth, they were slightly different from the first two, but they looked European. Lorenz had found DNA unlike any other from Native Americans. Most scientists believe that some 15,000 years ago, people walked from Asia across the landmass now covered by the Bering Straits into North America. Lorenz's results could be consistent with a new and controversial theory that proposes some of the earliest people migrated to America from Europe, perhaps by crossing an Atlantic Ocean significantly narrower than it is today. If our genetic analysis shows that these individuals really do belong to a new and previously unidentified lineage, founding lineage in the New World, it would be very big news. So the race is on to find the final proof. But for the moment, Lorenz's work has added to the mounting evidence of an early European migration and stirred the controversy over the most extraordinary journey in human history.